Well, uh, this morning I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is we are not going to be doing diagramming. Uh, so I'll give you a break from that. I know for, for most of you, that's probably good news. We've been doing a lot of that the last few sessions. The bad news is we will not escape from English grammar tonight, this morning um, <laughs> because, <laughs> uh oh, don't don't hang up, don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we will need to talk a little about it for our next uh, assignment that we're going to review. Because uh, remember, the my goal in, in these Zoom sessions was to go through the assignments with you and just review the necessary um, uh, information for those assignments and then go through an example with you and just to help remind and, and prepare you for, for that for that assignment. So as we consider the next assignment in the various steps of our uh, going through the process and preparing you for the module five passage, which is in second Timothy, uh, we're going to look at assignment 513. And just to recall and remember uh, where we've gone, where we come from, our first session together uh, after the module we had in person, the first session we did on Zoom was to read and observe the book. That's the first step in the exegetical process. And that's what we covered together in in that first session, session 5.1. And then the, the next session we looked at, we reviewed for the next assignment, which was the background context of the book. And then the third session, 5.3, we reviewed the assignment 510, which was the contextual flow of the book, Second Timothy. And then the fourth assignment, uh, sorry, the fourth step of the block diagram, that's where we spent a lot of time, uh, seven sessions actually, uh, going through the connector words and the assignment for that. And then of course the diagramming practicing for Second Timothy. So we did a number of passages. I think we did about eight or nine verses from the chapter one and we did a few verses from chapter four which you can incorporate into your your diagrams and so those were what we've covered the first of uh, the first 10 sessions together and again i think as you guys know or should know by this point you can access those sessions if you go to the canvas um and i'll just review remind you of that quickly here so if you go to canvas of course go to the tmei.instructure.com and log in and just by way of review to remind you as we go let's see let me find our group cdo preaching five okay so Hopefully you can see this okay. All right. So this is, of course, when you log in, this is where you'll be. And again, everything, if you're not remember where to go, you can always go to this link to download all course files. So if you have any questions about assignments, about uh, 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 about uh, files, things like that, the videos, just press this link, of course, and you'll be here. Uh, if you have any questions about our schedule or the passage that you've been assigned, it's in th this document here. You can download here. And then each session, again, I put all the information for each session here. So I've got the notes from that session. I've got the assignment that was related to that session. And then the video that reviews that particular assignment for that session. So I've got it all here, guys. So everything is here. And again, I think I think you all know this already, but just wanted to assure you that I'm continuing to update it. So we have last week's here, session 510, which is all connected to assignment 5.12, which I have noted for you in the seventh session. That's when we started. Okay. So all of it's here and you can access that again just by going to that. I put a big, big font there. So hopefully it's obvious. You guys can, can see it right away. Okay. So that's uh, that. Uh, another, since we're talking about sort of administrative things, another thing I, I just want to remind you of is make sure to enroll 
in this next module, module six. Uh, a few of you have done that, but not everybody. So please make sure to do that uh, as quick as soon as you are able. And um, again, you don't have to pay the tuition now if you're not able. You, we can do that the, the first day of class if if you can't do it now. And then we'll just have to upload the receipts like we did last time together. Um, but yeah, please make sure to to do that and to enroll. The other thing is in the assignments, I've uh, I talked about a couple months ago. We I made a new assignment just for uh, it's basically an agreement for the book that you were um, given from uh, I think it was Mike Fabara's preaching book. Just that you would agree not to forward that or copy it or give it to anyone else. It was just for your personal use. So I did ask. Yeah. I have not done that yet. That okay. book with Tabaris, I haven't downloaded. I have not downloaded it yet. And I have not done the, I didn't sign the agreement yet. Okay. Also. So I'll do that later because I'm I'm too busy, Pastor Tim. I will yeah. do first the, I think I'll do first the enrollment and then proceed with my assignments. That's fine. That's fine. I'm just bringing it to your guys' attention because uh, it's, case lang, case it's a unique, yeah, it's a unique assignment and that it's not really an assignment. It's just an agreement, but I just wanted to make you guys aware again, in case you saw that as an assignment to do later, um, I'd, I'd rather you just take a look as soon as you're able, you guys, and uh, just it's just an agreement to help us be accountable uh, bef before each other and the Lord. That's all. So just ask you to please take care of that. OK, so anyway, going back to to the class. So so far, we've looked at reviewed assignments 8, 5.8 all the way through 5.12. Today, Lord willing, I'd like us to take a look at the next assignment, assignment 513, which is the next two steps in the exegetical process, the textual observation and the significant words. And so I'd like to do that. And then next session, next week, Lord willing, we'll go to the last assignment, well, second to last assignment, which is the primary matters. So that is the uh, consulting the resources, the exegetical idea, the timeless truths, uh, meditation, homiletical ideas. We put all those in one assignment. To, to do so lord willing review that the next week the last assignment is simply the manuscript for your sermon for second timothy okay so this week again the, the idea is to look at this next step this fifth step which is the start the textual observations to make textual observations of the passage and if you remember in this step um, our attention is focused on now that we've done the diagram that's in the fourth step. The fifth step, the next step, is to then focus attention on some of the details of the passage. Now, in this in this case, the textual observations, notice um, it's going to be of the passage. So I gave you an assignment to do the connector words for all of 2 Timothy, and then I gave you the assignment to do the diagram for all of 2 Timothy. But in step five, you only have to do this for your passage. So you don't have to do it for the whole book, okay? Just your passage. But I did want you to diagram the whole book. So that will include your passage, of course, but I, I wanted you to practice diagramming, and so I wanted you to do the whole book. But for step five and, and step six, you're just going to focus on your passage, your assigned passage, okay? So please please remember that. Otherwise, it's going to be a long assignment for you. So. I don't want you to, to misunderstand this particular assignment. Okay, so just focus on your passage. And in that focus, what you're going to do is, and this is nothing new. We've done this for the previous modules. So um, this won't be a, a new thing at all for you. But uh, in this step, we focus attention on the grammatical details of your passage. So you're going to look at the verbs, the pronouns, the conjunctions. You're going to look at them one more time. We've looked at them in some sense when we did the diagram. But now you're going to look at them in detail, looking for particular things, looking for 
a particular ways that's connected. So for example, uh, what I wanted to do with us this morning is let's we'll use 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 8, because that's what we diagrammed last week. So hopefully it's still a little bit familiar to us. And we'll go use this passage for our example in going through um excuse me, going through the textual observations and the word study for this step. All right, so that is our um, I'm just writing myself a quick note here. Something that came to my mind. Okay, so with that, uh, let's let's jump right in. Are there any questions on um, anything we talked about up to this point first? Just want to ask that first. Anything about uh, the assignments, where to find stuff, um, schedule, anything that we've discussed so far? What I did for this assignment 5.13, Pastor, the whole book. Mm -hmm. do you, oh, you did it already? <laughs> Almost. Oh, okay. I'll give you extra credit. <laughs> I'll give you extra credit. <laughs> Sorry, if you know, notice That's on why the Yeah, it's just your passage. <laughs> yeah, it, it is in the instructions, but I'm sorry about that. But I'll, I'll give you extra credit if you did more than your passage. So I will not erase Pastor. No. I will. Just make sure your passage is done. But yeah, leave everything there. I'll 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 take a look. Um and like I said, I'll I'll give you extra credit for that. So you'll get bonus points. Wow. <laughs> and then maybe reward. <laughs> you're rewarded. <laughs> yeah. Maybe your classmates will pay you for their passage. No, don't do that, guys. Do your own work, but <laughs> joke long. So all right. Well, I'm sorry, Pastor Arn. But yeah, make sure guys to read the instructions if you're working ahead, because I, I think I put everything there to indicate that. But uh apparently the Lord wanted you to do some extra work on this this assignment, Pastor Arn. <laughs> I'm sorry. So at this point, uh we'll use Second Timothy one going through that and uh, let's go ahead and read it just to read the text I'll ask uh, uh, Brio if your microphone's working could you read this passage can you hear me sir yes very good okay second Timothy chapter 1 verse 6 to 8 for this reason you to kindle a Christ, the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of either the witness about our Lord or me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of, of God. All right, thank you. Okay, so in textual observations, uh, the first thing we're going to examine is we want to identify the verbs in our text. And we want to identify the three primary characteristics of the verbs. All right, now in the diagram, we identify the verbs just for the purpose of doing the diagram, but here in the textual observations, we're not actually going to examine those verbs more carefully to look at uh, how they are functioning, what they are doing within the passage. And to do that, we want to identify the three main characteristics of the, of the verb. And if you will remember, those characteristics are the tense, the mood, and the voice. All right, that's that is uh, the three characteristics, whether in English or in Greek. And we're going to, of course, we're just looking at the English. 
the English translation that you used, but uh, in doing so, we're, we're looking at uh, these three elements, the tense, the mood, and the voice. Now, again, remember, for English tense, there are three basic tenses. There's a few others, but we're just focusing on the basic ones, past, present, or future. So I put some examples, right? He preached the word that happened in the past. He preaches the word. That's a present tense use. And he will preach the word. That's future. And in English, remember, will or shall is a good indicator of uh, or tells you that you're the future, this idea is a future tense being used. Uh, the mood. This one's a, a little more complicated. The mood, there are four moods that we look at. Some would include a fifth, the conditional mood, but, but I don't really see it that way. I think these are the four primary moods of the verbs. The indicative mood, remember that is a statement of fact or a declaration. In this case, he preaches the word, or he preached the word, or he will preach. All three of these examples actually are indicative. They're making statements. They're declaring something. That's indicative. Indicating something. So they indicate uh, a particular event or statement. So that's why it's called indicative. Now, imperative is command. Preach the word. Uh, so that is a command. That's a different mood. It's not making a statement of fact. It's actually telling someone to do something. So we call it to an imperative. Um, so that that's that's the imperative mood. Now, the interrogative mood is just simply a question. And in English, of course, the question mark is an indicator. Did he preach the word? Well, will he preach the word? Uh, that that will be a question. So that's interrogative. To inter interrogate someone is to ask them questions. So the interrogative mood is a mood of question. We don't know the answer. In the indicative mood, we know the answer. It's a statement. In the imperative mood, it's what we want to have happen. In the interrogative mood, we don't know the answer. So we're asking. In the subjunctive mood, that's the fourth one here. It's kind of in between. It's, it's a statement with some uncertainty to it. He might preach the word. So words like might or may indicate some doubt. We don't know. We can't make it as a statement of fact or a declaration. We don't have certainty. So we call that the subjunctive mood. I don't remember why subjunctive was the word chosen for this, but that's what it is. And so it it uh, it is a you know it's a possibility, but we don't know for certain. Uh, and in a question, a question that's in the subjunctive mood might be: Should he preach the word? All right. So. You could have a situation where it's an interrogative, but maybe there's a question to it. So I don't know in this case uh, if you I don't know if you can really have two moods. So I think I would just call this interrogative, but it does incorporate some doubt as well. But this would be an interrogative mood if you see a question. But um, there is another mood in Greek. Now, there's not this uh, in English. The, the optative mood is a mood of. Great doubt, I would call it, or uncertainty. So it, you would probably see it in English translated as he perhaps might preach the word. It's great doubt. There's only a handful, I think seven or eight cases of the optative mood in Greek in the New Testament. So it's very, very rare. Um, and in English, it may not show up in the translation. I think one example is uh, from, let's see if I can remember here. One example is in Acts, I think Acts 17, if I remember. Um, 
Yes, verse 27. This is where Paul is speaking to the Athenians, and he's on Mars Hill, and he's making a case uh, to them about the, the go unknown God that they he saw an idol of. And as he's describing the one true God, he says uh, that this God made from every one, from one man every nation, to inhabit all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him. See that? Notice in the English text, it has, if perhaps they might. So notice that is actually, if I go to the Greek text in verse 27 here, um, this is, I don't know if you can see it on the screen down below, but it says at the bottom of my screen, it says verb, eris, active, optative. I don't know if you can see that. The font's pretty small for this this verb right here. So that verb is in the optative. All right. So that's one example. And notice the English translation does a good job of picking that up. If perhaps they might grow. So this is suggesting that that men don't seek God. Really that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grow for him. Well, honestly, and we Paul says this in Romans, uh, that no one seeks for God. So he's really presenting here. He's not saying that some people actually do. He's saying it's, a, it's very, very unlikely that this would happen. Okay? And he uses the optative mood to express that doubt. Was there a question? So um, I just bring this up because if in English you see something like this where there's a perhaps, maybe, they might, if you see more than one of those put together, that could indicate sort of this great doubt, great uh, uncertainty regarding whether or not a particular action is going to happen, okay? Okay. So I don't put this for English because we don't really have an optative mood in English, but I am pointing it out to you just because uh, it is in Greek. So I'm just kind of, that's a bonus, a free bonus for you uh, here. But when you do your, your textual observation, just focus on these four moods, okay? You don't have to worry about the optative. I'm just uh, giving that to you just so you're aware of that. Sometime you might see that word used. There's only, like I said, I'm trying to remember the other passages, but there's only a few examples of it in the New Testament. Okay, so tense, past, present, future, mood, indicative, imperative, interrogative, subjunctive, and then finally, the voice. The voice is simply a way in which we see how the verb is, is functioning, whether or not the subject is doing the action, or the actions being done to the subject. So an active mood, he preached the word. The subject's doing the action. He's the one doing the preaching. So that's active. All right, he's doing, subject's doing it. But passive is the, the object is the actions being done, sorry, to the subject. So in this case, in the sentence, the, the word is the subject. The word was preached. So the word isn't doing the preaching, but it, it was preached. Okay? So that's passive because the subject's not doing the action. The action's being done to the subject or using the subject to do the action. Now, in Greek, there's a middle voice. And in English, you might see it this way. He preached uh himself the word or he preached a word for himself or something like that and here it's where the subject does the action to or for himself all right so in english you may have that added idea he preached uh the word he preached himself the word he preached a word for himself something like that in greek 
you would just have preached in the middle voice. And that would tell you that the preaching he did was for himself or his benefit. All right. Uh, so English, you may not see that. So just worry about active and passive in English. Again, I, I'm just telling you about the middle voice because that is fairly common in Greek. You may see it if you look at an interlinear and it says middle voice. Uh, I just want you to understand what that means. Okay. Now in Greek, the middle and passive voices, the verb will look similar. It'll have a similar ending. So sometimes it's not always obvious. So you may see an in interlinear, it says middle or passive. Uh, but um, just for, for the, just look at the English word and English will be passive. And it usually is indicated by the verb of being in front of the, the word. So the word was preached. Um, I will be... Uh, happy, okay? This is passive. I will be. I, I will be helped. Passive. Yeah, future passive in this case, okay? All right. Any questions on that review? All right. Well, let's, let's do it then for 2 Timothy. We'll just do a verse at a time. I'm gonna ask. Uh, I'm gonna ask Pastor Allen to start us off in verse six. Just identify the verbs, and then tell us the uh, the the mood, tense, or voice. And I think I what I'll do is just put these over here. Give me a second to. Okay. All right. So, um, Alan, if, if you could. Let me, I'm sorry. It would help if I pull the verse up here. If you could let us know from verse six what the mood, the verb, find the verbs, and then tell us the, the mood, tense, and voice. In verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Uh, for this reason, I remind you. I remind, remind you. Yes, good. Okay. Remind. Because, uh, Uh, that's uh, active. Ah, I mean, is that mood? Mood first or uh, tense? Okay. Yeah, let's I start remind with you, that's, that's present. Yes, present tense. And the mood is imperative. Okay, is he commanding Timothy or is he making a statement? I remind you. I think it's it's just a statement, so it's indicative. Yeah. Now, I remind you to kindle kind of has a feel of a command, right? But yes, yes. That's, that's why I, I feel the, the tone. Yeah, the tone is more of a, he's not just suggesting it, but grammatically, it's it's a it's not in it's not in the imperative mood. Yeah. All right. And then okay, so uh, that's, uh, the voice. Present, indicative, and the voice is active. Very good. Yep, the, the subject's doing the action. I, mind you. All right. Uh, the gift Any of God verse? which is in you through. Any other regular verbs? I think there's none. Which is is 
Is is a is, verb. Yes, right? yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. In you through the laying on of my hands. So there's none other than that. Okay, how about is? What's the yes, yes. Is is uh present. Which is so mood. Is he commanding it's a, a statement question? What? What's that? No, it's not a question. Uh it's a indicative. Yes, he's making a statement, isn't he? Yeah. Okay, good. It's indicative. All right. And still still active. Yeah, it's active. All right. Very good. All right, James, I'm going to give you verse 7. Okay. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. So just identify, do you see any verbs there in verse 7? Gibbons? Yes. Technically, it's a has given. Yeah. And is this, what? what's the tense? Is this something? That's the mood. And yes, it is indicative. What is the tense? Past, present, or future? Past. Yes. That word has is the clue. It's a past action. And then is it active or passive voice? Very good. The subject's doing the action. God has not given us. Good. Any other verbs in verse 7 that you see? What about immediately? Immediately. Immediately. Okay. Is that an action or is that is that a verb or a noun? Noun. Yeah, it's a noun actually here. So there actually there's no other no. verbs in verse seven. You had an easy job. Only one. So very good. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention uh when we did verse six, uh someone might say, Well, look to kindle. Well, that has a verb in it. Uh kindle is a verb, but uh what we're looking for, guys, is just the regular verb. This is actually called what? What is to kindle? Infinitive. It's an infinitive. All right. It's got the preposition to followed by a verb. So it's an infinitive. So it doesn't have a mood. Okay. Some would say infinitive is the mood, but infinitive doesn't have a mood. It has a tense. It's a it's a present tense, and it has a voice. It's it's technically it's active. But it doesn't have a mood because it's infinitive. So you don't have to do the, the verbals. Remember, this is called a verbal. It looks like a verb, but it doesn't act just like a verb. So, um, and the same here with laying. Right? Laying on, laying on is not. A a, it's a gerund. Right. It's a noun here. Okay, so it's not a verb I, at all. But it is a verbal. It looks like a verb. So these two you don't have to do because they're not regular verbs. We're just looking for regular verbs here, all right? So that's why we didn't do those two words in verse 6 because of that. Now, verse 7, we, we don't have that. We just have the regular verb has not given, all right? So uh, let's see. Brilio, I'm going to ask you to do verse 8. Verse 8, sir. Yes. Verse eight, verse 8, where is? Uh, therefore, do not be ashamed of either the witness about our Lord or me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power 
according to the power of God. Verb, sir. Yes. No. Then do not be ashamed. Yeah. So no. do, ah, yeah. do not be ashamed. Yep. What what's the tense, the voice, and the mood? Ten, tense, mood, and voice. It seems, sir. But first, look like the word do not be ashamed seems it seems like an imperative yes yeah, actually it is right he's saying yep. uh, it's imperative now what tense do you think this is he's telling him usually imperatives are are going to be only in one tense typically in english yep uh it seems like present yeah it's present tense then, imperative now the voice is a little bit of a challenge here what does it look like uh voice sir yeah it seems like passive yeah it's the passive technically because be ashamed. So notice that verb of being here, be ashamed. Um, all right. Now, let's say you aren't sure. You guys, I, I'd like you to at least think about it first. And then if you if you want, you can go to the to the uh, interlinear and get some guidance there. But I prefer you not do that at the beginning. Um because in the interlinear, it'll just show you the tense and all this in Greek. But if you're not sure, you can look up. So, let you know, let's do that just for an example. Let's look up the from Bible Hub. What does it tell us? And we're in 2 Timothy here. 1, interlinear. Chat, uh, verse... Eight, I believe, and let's expand this a little to see it better. Okay, here's the word you should not be ashamed of. Okay, and then let's look at below it, it tells us it's an aorist subjunctive passive. Now, here we learn that it's a subjunctive mood, but this is where not knowing Greek well enough can get us a little bit in trouble because. Um, an error subjunctive is typically functions as a command. All right. So this is where sometimes the interlinears may not be clear if we don't know Greek well enough. Uh, but the English translation is correct to put it as a command because that is how, in this case, an error subjunct subjunctive works here. But notice it does say passive. Okay, so in the interlinear often will be a help, but sometimes it may not. So it may not, it may, it may add some other elements there. So just be aware of that. That's why I want you to do this in English. Um, just the English verb. Okay. Video, any other verbs in verse 8 that you see i think sir join but join with me in suffering yes join with me in suffering and what so join is the verb what's the tense mood and voice Present, sir. yes and indicative okay is he making a statement did he say, you joined with me in suffering? Or is he saying, join with me? It seems like command. It's a command. To win with me. Yes, so it is a command. A, it's a, be an imperative. 
than active. And active, yes. All right. Now, if he had said be joined with me, that would be passive. Because it's something else doing the joining. But it'd still be a command. But it is, that would be passive. But in this case, he just says join with me. That's active. Very good. Any other verbs that you see here? There's none, sir. Correct. That's it. All right. So pretty simple here. We just had five verbs to deal with in this text and looked at their, their uh, characteristics. Okay. So that's it for the verbs. Now we want to move on in our textual observations to the pronouns. And remember, with pronouns, uh, in this case, we want to identify each pronoun. There's two parts to this. Identify each pronoun and then say what it refers to in the text. What's the reference? What's its antecedent? That's a more technical term. So remember, for when identifying a pronoun, you identify the number and the person. All right. So it's um, first person are these, of course, you know, I, we, us, my, our. Second person, you, your. Third person, he, she, they, them, they're his. And then the number is either singular or plural. So if I say I, that's first person singular. We is first person plural. He First person singular. They, first, third, sorry, third person singular. They is third person plural. Okay, so you just need to identify the each pronoun. I should have put this more, the number and the person. And then what Store. it refers to. Question? Store. Yeah. Uh... The pronoun you in second person, uh, as I have understood, uh, there is plural and singular. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. So here's the problem in English. This is yet another challenge in the English language. And that challenge is that uh, in English, the, the uh, plural and singular is not... Not clear. You or your could be either one. In most languages, I imagine Sabuano probably, you can tell, right? If it's singular or plural, is it a different word like in Sabuano? So would, would you know in Sabuano if you're speaking of one or many? Is there a different word? Yeah. yeah. It's that way in, in Greek, in Hebrew, most languages actually. But in English... It is, uh, you can't tell from just the word. Unless it was you yourselves. If it was yourselves, that would be obviously plural because yourself would be singular. But if it's just you or your, we can't tell. So there's a couple ways to figure that out. Um, uh, one is sometimes the context will make it clear. So for example, I, I, uh, if we look at, if we're reading in Philemon, for example, this is a personal letter of Paul uh, to Philemon, right? And so he says here, I always, I thank my God always making mention of you in my prayers. And I hear of your love, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And so the question is, well, is that singular or plural? It could be, it seems to be Philemon, but it could be the church as well. Because he says, and to the church in your house. But notice verse five. Because, uh, sorry, verse 7. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Ah, so I know at least in verse 7, it's singular because he says through you, brother. And then I would assume probably verse the verses before that and after that would be singular but uh, and that actually is the case all the way up until verse 
21, I think, when it says, uh, or no, verse 22, when he says, I hope through your prayers I will be given to you. Those yous are actually plural. Because now he's referring to the church. Well, it's like, how would I know that? <laughs> I can't tell. It's the same spelling. And the context there isn't obvious. It seems to me be the same. But that's where that's where this the interlinear will help us. So for example, let's let's go to, to Philemon here. And I'll show you. Verse so verse uh like verse three. Grace to you. Now notice here it says it's second person plural. This to you here. So that is a, a Paul's giving greetings to the church in verse three. But when we get to verse four, I think the God, my God, always making mention of you. Now here it's singular. So he's talking just to Philemon here, hearing of your love right here, your love. That says singular, because in the Greek, there is a distinction between singular and plural. Um, the fellowship of your faith, singular. Verse seven, your love, singular. And you'll, if you were to go through all of the pronouns throughout the, all the way through the letter, they're all singular until I think it's verse 22. Verse 21, I write to you, singular. But then verse 22, I hope that through the prayers, your prayers, hear you is plural. And then again, plural. So he's, verses, verse three, plural, speaking to the church. Verse four, singular. Verse four through 21, singular, speaking to Philemon. Verse 22, plural, speaking again to the church. All right. Now, verse 23, greet Epaphras. Now he goes back to singular. He's speaking to Philemon. But then notice verse 25, his final statement, his conclusion, grace of the Lord Jesus be with you, or uh, sorry, be with your spirit. Your here is plural. Okay, so don't take it for granted. Don't assume, especially on a letter like this to Philemon, where he addresses it to Philemon and to the church. You've got to go through it and make sure you identify the you and the your. All right. Now, most of the time in the epistles, you're going to have the you and your will be plural because he's writing to the church. But in the individual epistles, Titus, Timothy, 1st, 2nd Timothy, uh, Philemon, you've got to check and make sure. Now, I believe in Timothy, the you and your is, is typically going to be singular. All right, but we can always check and make sure from the interlinear, okay? So that's just something that you need to, to, keep, to keep in mind. All right, was that, uh, did that make sense? Thank you, Pastor. Did that, uh, okay. So again, I'm sorry, this is just an added complexity with English. The pronouns you and your aren't always the same, but it's important because if you're preaching Philemon, for example, you want to make sure you know who he's talking to, to be accurate. Um, so we're looking at 2 Timothy in this case. The you and the yours probably will be Timothy, but we're going to want to check just to make sure because um, I believe the letter was only addressed to Timothy. Right, if we go back and take a look um, at Second Timothy, to Timothy, 
my beloved. So he doesn't add anyone else to the recipient. So it's very, very likely, I believe it is the case, that every you and your that we see in the letter is going to be to Timothy. But it doesn't hurt just to look at the interlinear really quick and make sure. All right. Now, for the other. Um, sorry, I didn't share that with you. For the other pronouns in Timothy, I, we, they, them, he, she, our, that's all you can tell from the word itself if it's single or plural. It's only the you, your that gives us trouble. Okay. All right. Well, with that, let's let's dive in, take a look at the pronouns now in 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 8. Let's see. I think, um, Alex, is your audio working? Are you able to, I know you said you were, you were having problems with your laptop. Can you do the audio? Yes, Pastor Tim. Okay. Can you please, uh, for just verse 6, identify the pronouns and then who they refer to? For this reason, I remind you to kindle the first the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of laying on of my hands. Uh, first, uh, first pronoun is I, singular. Okay. I first person singular. I. I yep. First person singular. You. Uh, Sorry. Second. First. Uh, what, what, who does I refer I, to? How's that, Pastor? Uh, who does For the pronoun reason, I refer to? For this reason, I. Uh, himself. Which is whom? Uh, Paul. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, Paul <laughs> the author. So, yeah, make sure. When you do the pronouns for textual observation, you need to identify the, the, the person and number, and then also who does it refer to in the passage. Okay. All right. Sorry. So the next pronoun. Next pronoun is you. Second person singular. <clears throat> who does it refer to? Referring to Timothy. Yeah. And we'll confirm that with the interlinear because it is you, but that's that is, I think, the, the it seems from the context to be clearly just Timothy. Okay, any others? Uh the second you. Yeah, there's two you. So you don't need so, to repeat yeah. that if it's the same same person, it's the same pronoun and the yeah. same reference. But yeah, okay. you is referred to twice. Any others besides the I or you? Uh, the last one, my. Yes. Uh, first person singular refers to himself, Paul. Paul. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Kazot, verse seven. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Us refers to uh, plural. Refers to both to Timothy and Paul. Okay, us. Sorry, first person, plural, good. And it refers to Paul and Timothy. And then uh, there, I the question, this would be a th theological question, is perhaps all believers? Certainly Paul and Timothy at least. But it may, he may intend it to extend to all believers, right? God has yes, not given yes. us Christians. Us. So that would be just a really a theological question. Grammatically, it could be either one would be possible. All right. 
but you might want to put a question is, is he referring to all believers, not just himself and Timothy? In the context, it seems just likely Paul and Timothy, because he's only Paul speaking to Timothy. But there is a possibility he could extend it beyond just himself and his hearer, but but be, it could be a broad principle. Does that make sense? Yes, Pastor Tim. Okay. Are there verse any others? Eight. Oh. Yeah, Verse. any others in verse 7? No other, Pastor Tim. Okay. So because that was easy... Uh, you got to do verse eight. You only had one <clears throat> verse. Seven. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, our first person plural, referring to uh, Timothy and Paul, or maybe uh, to all believers theologically. <laughs> yeah, definitely at least Paul and Timothy, perhaps. All believers. Okay. Any others? Me, first person, singular, refers to Paul. Yes. All right. Now notice what do we what do we notice about that me there in the text? You see anything different about it? It's italic. Yeah, it's in italics. Do you guys remember what that indicates? It is added by the translators. Yes. So now it is in the English translation. So I want I would want you to include it in this assignment. But I just want you to note, right? You should be paying attention to every detail. Note. Literally, it would be join with in suffering for the gospel. So the implied noun is me, but it's not there technically, right? And we could see that if we go to the interlinear here. Let's just take a look. Verse 8. Well, first, let's confirm... Uh, Let's confirm verse 6, where we had this U. Just make sure it's singular. And then we'll look at verse 8. So verse 6. Verse 6. I remind you. Here's the U. And let's look. Second person singular. Singular pronoun. All right. So. We were correct there. It's singular, so that's good. Now, verse 8, let's look at where he says, join with me. Notice that the verb actually is suffer together for the gospel. So the, the verb includes within it this idea of doing it together. So technically, the literal translation here would be, uh, it's not but join with me. The, the literal translation would be, but suffer together for the gospel. The idea is, let's suffer together. And it says imperative, so we were correct about that. But the English translation, uh, suffer together is a little more, it's not typical way you would say it. In English, so join with me is a, is a sufficient and acceptable translation. But notice in the actual Greek text, there is no with and there is no me. So there's no preposition and there's no pronoun in the original Greek. It's just, the but the verb has that idea. When he says suffer together, it, it is the idea of join together with me in suffering. So they sort of reworded it to make it easier to understand, but literally there. So this whole phrase, uh, join with me in suffering, technically is literally suffer together for the gospel. Now, 
normally and then i picked this up when i did the diagram because remember i told you in the diagram do the diagram for your translation but then you need to check it and you can check it looking at other translations or check it by looking at the interlinear so if you looked at the interlinear you would have seen paul just says but that's in the english suffer together for the gospel so for the gospel is in the translation right um Sorry, pull that one down. Right? For the gospel is, we saw in the Greek text, we see it in the English translation, but this, it's but suffer together for the gospel. That's what it literally says. So join with me in suffering is just a way that they sort of uh, made it more readable in English because that, that's more readable and it reflects the same idea, but it technically is not is not as literal as the translation because there's no preposition with, there's no preposition in. It's just suffer together. That's the verb for the gospel. Because what Paul did here is he joined the preposition with, that's soon, with the verb suffer. Kakopao. I believe. Yeah. Kakopatheo, actually. So it's literally suffer with. But soon has the idea, uh, the preposition has the idea of, of being together. So Paul did this a lot, actually, where he would add this preposition soon to another word and he'd make up a new word. I don't know if that this is a new word, but we see this in Ephesians in several places where he just put this preposition soon with a verb and then formed a new word out of it. To give to emphasize this idea of it being done together. OK, so that's that's what he did here. In any case. OK, but as far as. Pronouns are concerned. Pronoun me, so that should have been a clue to you. That, hey, there's something different here, and the translation's telling me that they they added this word to 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 smooth out to make the translation a little easier to read. But that should have been a clue, like, hey, there's something different. I should go look at the interlinear and see what they did. Okay. So, but the pronoun me is first person singular refers to Paul. So what I want you to do in the assignment is do the English for that. All right. Questions, guys, on this? Remember, at module five, we do a little bit more advanced stuff. So that's why I'm showing you the interlinear and discussing some of these additional details, because you need to be aware of this um, as you're doing a deeper study. But any any questions so far? All right. Well, let's let's continue to suffer together through the text. All right. So we'll we'll keep moving forward using Paul's words. Now that's the verbs and pronouns. The next step in the textual observation is to look at the conjunctions and you say well we already did that when we did the the uh um diagram didn't we yeah yes we did but again what i like to do is have us revisit the conjunctions are keyword verbs are important words in um uh, you know to, to understand and look at in the text but also conjunctions are and so if you remember, in conjunctions, we want to be able to identify what kind of conjunction. So that's what we're going to do in this step is identify, is it coordinating or subordinating? Now, by this point, if you did the connector words, you should have thought about this. But here in the textual observations, we want to make an explicit statement for each of the connector words as to whether, sorry, each of the conjunctions as to what kind it is and what it's doing. So here in this step, note all the coordinating and subordinating conjunctions indicate what's being connected. Now remember, coordinating 
are just our five favorite ones, and boy, and nor, but, or yet. They connect words, phrases, or clauses that are grammatically equal. The subordinating, that idea of sub or under, connects a dependent clause to a word it modifies. And then these are some of the common ones. All right? So what we're going to do now in this step is just look for the coordinating, subordinating conjunctions, and then just say briefly what it's doing in the sentence. Okay? All right, I'll do the first one. Remember, for this reason is actually the conjunction, and it's it's subordinating. It's it's one of those more challenging ones. Sometimes a conjunction will be more than one word, and in this case, it is. For this reason is the conjunction. It's subordinating, okay, because, again, it's not amboy. It's not one of these five over here. It's subordinating, which means... It's subordinating a phrase clause or even a paragraph. And then that's what it's doing here. If you remember last, I think it was last week, we talked about sometimes a subordinate, uh, oftentimes a conjunction is used to introduce a new paragraph. And when it does, it behaves similarly. So in this case, it's subordinating, meaning this paragraph versus six and following comes under a previous paragraph. So I believe it's, and this would just under, come with more study. I think verse seven, um, subordinate to or under verses three to five. So I think this paragraph, verses six to 11, is, is the response to verses three to five. Okay. So that one's a little more challenging because it's introducing a paragraph. All right, now the rest of them are just going to be connected within the paragraph here, so you don't have to worry about that. So I'm going to ask um, Alan if you could do verse 7. Can you identify the conjunctions in verse 7 for us? And then what they're doing. Verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. Four. Yes. Uh, this is a conjunction. What kind? Uh, subordinating. Yes, it is. Because it's not, it's not one of the five. So it's subordinating. And we know it's a conjunction because it's followed by a... Clause. Clause, yeah. Remember, if it's a preposition, it will be followed by a noun. For example, here, for the gospel. The gospel is a noun. Therefore, the for here is a preposition. But in verse 7, the for is a conjunction because it's followed by a clause. Now, subordinating, you're correct. How is it connected in the sentence? Uh, it's subordinating because it's uh, uh, it refers to the first, the previous clause. Yes. And remember, four has the idea of because, right? Usually gives a reason. Yes, because. So it gives a reason for what? Uh, to to kindle afresh the gift. Yes. Gives reason to kindle afresh the gifts. All right, very good. This is why. Why kindle afresh? Because God has not given us a spirit of timidity. Very good. All right, any other conjunctions here? But. What kind is that? That's a coordinating conjunction. Very good. So that means it's going to connect to grammatically equal words, phrases, or clauses. What's it connecting here? Uh, it's connect. It's connecting to. Uh, Paul is connecting it to uh, uh, the kind of spirit that was given to us. 
a spirit of yeah. timidity. Ano? Yeah, you're God right. God has not given us. Yes. In he contrast, has not given us a spirit of timidity connected to that, but the opposite. Yeah. So I put contrasts of timidity. Because notice it's of power. Of so power. It's, a, it's not a spirit of timidity, but a, and then we could say, right, a spirit of power. Now he doesn't say, he doesn't repeat spirit, but that's the idea. Okay. Great. All right. Any others? And. 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 What kind is that? Uh, coordinating. And what is it connecting? Uh, it's connected to what kind of spirit we were given. Yeah, it connects love to power. Power, yes. And right. another end, self-discipline. And, yeah. and coordinating and conjunction. Coordinating connects self-discipline. Still connected, still connected to, to the previous. In this case, yeah. Kinds, power, power and love and, and self-discipline. Yeah. Okay. Good. Very good. All right. Uh, video, I'm going to ask you to do verse eight. Good job, Alan. Video. Yes, sir. Verse eight, sir. Yeah. Um, either so yes and remember either was that sort of new one we talked about uh, either or remember or it's uh it goes together either the witness or me and that was called, we called it a, a, a correlative, but um, in this case, that word or tells us what, what kind of conjunction is it, subordinating or coordinating? Uh, I think, sir, uh, subordinating. Okay, notice the word or, though. Where do we see or over here? Is or coordinating um, or subordinating? Oh. Coordinating, sir. Coordinating. Yeah. Or. It's coordinating. So even though it's this correlative thing, in this case, it has the conjunction or in it. So it's acting like a coordinating. And what is it connecting? If it's coordinating, it's connecting towards phrases or clauses that are equal. What are, What's it connecting? Connects with do not be ashamed. Okay, that's that's the object. Uh, do not be ashamed of either the witness, Lord, or uh, I think me. me. Yeah, it connects witness and to me. me. They're both the subject. Do not be ashamed of the witness. Do not be ashamed of me. This is how we would how we diagrammed it last week. Therefore, do not be ashamed of either the witness, what kind of witness about our Lord, or, and I put either or together here, and line them up, or, sorry, whoops, I meant to put that here, me. And then his prisoner modifies me. Okay, so notice either the witness I'll just put that or me. Those are the parallel connected, in this case, words. It's connecting witness and me. Yep, sir. Okay. All right. Good. Any other? Let's go back but, up. Sir. But. but. All right. What kind of conjunction is that? Coordinating. Yes, it is. And what's it connecting? I tried to figure out, sir. Okay. So, 
we know that what follows it is, but join with me. Right? Join. So this is a clause, right? There's a verb join. The subject is you. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. So yes, sir. it's going to connect to another clause. Because remember, it connects to words, phrases, or clauses that are equal. So since it's this is a clause, it's going to connect that clause to another clause. What clause does it connect it to? I think, sir, the another imperative, the above. Right. Yes. Do not yes. be ashamed. Exactly. Great. So it connects join with me to do not be ashamed. Yes, him. Okay. So yeah, this is what so in the when we diagrammed it, this is what we had. Uh whoops. Do not be ashamed of me. But join with me. So two commands. All right. So if we're if you're preaching this passage, you're going to have Paul gives two commands. And they contrast. He says, don't do this, but do this. You see that? So they're both equal. Equal in importance. All right. So. Uh, so we wouldn't say connects, I would say contrasts, basically, at that point. All right? That makes sense? Yes, Clear? sir. Okay. Do you yes, see sir. any other conjunctions in verse 8? I think, sir, none. Okay, there is one more. Um, uh... Mm -hmm. For the gospel according to the power of God. Yeah, I heard James say it, I think. The word therefore. therefore. Yeah, therefore. the first word, therefore. <laughs> All right. Therefore, usually it's used uh, to... It, it's subordinating. Okay, it's yeah, not absolutely. one of these five, right? It's not one of these. In fact, we see it in our subordinating list. Now, here's the question. What is it connecting? Or what is it, uh, how is it functioning here? How's it working? So it's going to place what follows under something. It's going to modify something. What do you think it's connected to? Well, it does not be in us. Yeah, would you agree, Brilio? Verse 7, sir. Verse 7, sir. Yes. Gives, uh, I would say, um, result or reason. Result God has not given us. Therefore, do not be ashamed. Maybe we say response to. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. That's it. No more. It's clear. No more. That's it. <laughs> Very good. All right. Great job, guys. This, you're doing great. All right. These aren't. These are not all easy, but that's why we're going through it. So. That's what you do for the conjunctions on textual observations. The next are is to identify any contrasts or comparisons. So here are any contrasts or comparisons made. Now, contrasts are usually easier to find by just looking for the conjunction, but that's usually yeah. a presents a contrast. So I'm going to ask... Uh, Pastor Arn, if you're there, um, Pastor Arn, do you see any contrasts in this passage? Are you available, Dodong? According to him, sir, there is a parent, sir. A 
Oh. Entertainer. Ah, okay. I just saw the chat. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alex, how about you? Are you available? Yeah, still uh, studying the passage. Wait. Okay, just look for contrast. I mean, really, are there any buts here? We've already identified them, actually, when we did the conjunctions. There is a but in verse 7. Yep. So we have a but in verse 7. And we notice... Say... And we noted contra. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. It contrasts. Contrast between spirit of timidity and uh, spirit of power and love and self discipline. Yes. So yes. contrast timidity with power, power love, love, and self discipline. Self discipline. Yes. Good. You see any other contrasts in the passage? Verse eight. Verse eight. Verse eight. There's another but, and that con is contrasting yeah, what that's, that was already named by Pastor uh, Anselmo. Do not yeah. be ashamed, but join. All right, so contrast a negative command with a positive command. Don't be ashamed, but join with me. All right, good. All right, good, Alex. Thank you. Now, when we examine this passage and looking for comparisons, uh, do we see something being compared here? And... I would say I don't really see anything being compared. Normally, when these comparisons would be indicated by a, a like or an as. Uh, you know, he, he is like this or, or he behaves as that. So I don't really see a comparison here. So I think in this passage, we just have the two contrasts in verse 7 and verse 8. All right. All right, so that's what we look for. Then we look for any lists in the passage. Uh, I'll ask Noor about this. Noor, do you see any lists? And again, a list would be anything more than two items. Uh, power, love, self-discipline. Yes, in verse 7, right? Seven. Power, love, self-discipline. So he gives a list of what... Hmm. A uh, list of what of the sort of the spirit God God has given us. Okay. Any other list yeah. that you see, Nor? Uh, something. No. Uh, I have not seen any. I don't. I'm not sure. No, I think you're right. That's it in this passage. Just the one list. All right. So that's all we would need to note. Okay. Um, then the next purpose or result statements. All right. And here, I think we identified two when we looked at the conjunctions. We identified four God has not given. And we had said before, um, We had said that was a, a reason uh, to kindle afresh. And then we also noticed in verse 8, the therefore, therefore do not be ashamed, but join with me. Ashamed. But join with me. We noticed in this case, this was really sort of a, a result response to 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 God has give, has not given us therefore do not be ashamed so those would be two examples there's none in verse six that I noticed there okay 
Then the next would be conditional. Look for conditional clauses. And then it would be, if you're looking for like a word like if, and nothing in this passage that we can see here. So all you have to do, if you can't find any, just say none. None in this passage. Okay? All right. Figures of speech. Now, remember, figures of speech are not just in, in poetry. Figures of speech can are also used in epistles and narrative, things like that. So this is where you just look for, are there any words that would fall under what we studied in poetry regarding figures of speech? Metaphors, hyperbole, simile, uh, merisms, you know, all that stuff. You'll have to remember. Do we see anything like that here? Does anybody see anything where the word, again, remember, figure of speech would be um, uh, any word or phrase or clause that does not mean what it, it literally says. Verse 6, sir, in the Lapras. Okay. To kindle afresh may sound like figure of speech, but I think it, it actually is just a, uh, a, a literal, it means that literally. But uh, yeah, kindle maybe, because kindle normally refers to uh, like burning, yep. to start a fire. We cannot burn the gifts there. <laughs> yeah. You cannot burn the gift. So kindle afresh, uh, you know, maybe. Um, might be figurative. I think it's used that way so much in English that it actually is considered a literal action. So it's not literally burning, but some, it's a word that's evolved a little bit from, from that. That might be. I would put that down, but I wouldn't, I don't see any others. So you it could just, just mean right steer. Uh, I think it just means steer. steer. It means to like stir up, to, to do stir it, yes. to start it again. Um, right. It means to, to start a new, and you could, what you could do is, is this would be a good one to do a word study on to see, is this a figurative word or what is it? What does it mean? Is it literal or figurative? So I, this would be a good one to do word study, actually. But yeah, if you're not sure or if you think it is, you can just put it down. Okay. How about prisoner, Pastor Tim? Prisoner. Verse 8. Okay. Yeah, if you think he's not actually, doesn't literally mean he's a prisoner, Um but it's like a metaphor for something. Then if you look at the rest of the epistle, though, you'll notice that he does refer to himself being in prison. So here we, because of what he says elsewhere in 2 Timothy, uh, it's probably, it's literal here. But it could, sometimes it is used in a figurative way, that word. Uh, I'm a prisoner of your love. Well, you're not literally in prison. Uh, but... In this case, I think Paul is saying, literally, I am in prison. Right? We could go to maybe, uh, uh, let's see, does, where else does he mention prisoner? Oh, you know what? He only says the word once in the letter. So I think we would have to note it from chapter four. Um, <clears throat> when he talks about at my first defense, no one supported me, all deserted me. Um, and he talks about, right, that uh, I'm being poured out as a drink offering, time of my departure has come. So we kind of have to put those things together take that he likely means when he says prisoner that it's literal 
So as a prisoner, Pastor Tim, uh, uh, he's, is he trying to say that he is restrained, he can't do anything? Yeah, and, I think so. Because, uh, right, somebody who's in prison, you know, uh, can't, can't normally that's... Anywhere. Yeah, well, and it's shameful, right? Like, you know, if you're in prison, that means you're a criminal. And so that there's shame that, that comes with that. So I think Paul's saying, don't be ashamed of me since I'm a prisoner. Um, you know, because we might be like, right, if you've had relatives or someone, you know, who's in prison or been in prison or maybe you have. Right. That was a, a shameful can be bring shame to to you or, or those that know you or your friends or family. So I think that's what Paul is so, saying. So he's not. He's, he's what he's saying is he's, he's he's not free. He has no freedom. Yeah, he has no freedom, but also he's saying to Timothy, don't be ashamed of me because I'm in prison. Um so uh how, yeah how can he, we how can we relate that to uh the passage which says uh whom the sun sets free is free indeed? Well because I think here in that passage, he's talking about, you know, freedom from bondage to sin, from from sin, from the punishment of sin, the power of sin. In this passage, he's just talking about I'm, I'm a prisoner. I mean, I'm physically bound. I'm or in prison. Because yeah, of the gospel. Because of the gospel. In that passage you referenced, Alex, uh, it's talking more about the spiritual idea of, you know, who the sun sets free, free from what? Free from sin, free from the judgment and power of sin, then he's free indeed. So he's not in bondage to his sin or his himself anymore. But here Paul's not talking about being in bondage to his sin. He's talking about being in bondage, his body, physical body. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. I want to highlight, sir. Can I interrupt, yeah. sir? Go ahead. From our literal, literary context, Paul was in prison. That's yeah. why we cannot uh, put in figurative speech. Yeah. Because Go ahead. Of that context. Because of that context, sir. Yes. That's why, yeah, you need to understand the words around it. And in this case, you need to understand the letter as a whole to know Paul's situation. And um, because of other things he says that, you know, his time has come, that he's been deserted. No one came to his defense. So I think I think the idea is uh, that he is an actual physical prison. So he's not using this in a spiritual or figurative way in this case. At that time, Pastor Paul was in, was in prison because of the gospel. Yes. Yeah, this is historically this is referred to as his second Roman imprisonment. Um now we we learn from extra biblical records sources that early church fathers talk about Paul was again imprisoned in Rome in the persecution of Nero and was beheaded in about 68 AD 68. So um, but that's extra biblical sources tell us that. But I think even within the letter, we can see other statements he makes points to the fact that he's that he's in prison, that this prisoner here means it's meant literally. His first Roman imprisonment, we see in the book of Acts. Um, he was taken to Rome where he appealed to Caesar. And in that imprisonment, he wrote Ephesians Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon during his first Roman imprisonment. Here, Second Timothy is he's in his second imprisonment where he doesn't come out. Um, in this case, but it's a good question. Again, you want to look at words and and uh, some you can answer just from the immediate context. Some you need to yeah, understand I mean, more broadly. Yeah, so, just. just just trying to uh, cite this uh, just in case there's uh, an argument that comes up 
of this sort so how can we uh how can we answer answer back no great great question thank you for bringing it up and i think also pastor tim it can clarify when we consider also another passage which brother alex highlighted it, jesus he is there talking about enslavement to sin yeah uh, when he said uh you will be free indeed if the yeah. son has set you free because in the following verses he made it clear that he's talking about enslavement to sin yes so there you'd look at the context as well and when jesus said that what's the context here and looking at the the context the background of the letter what is said else in the letter we can understand prisoner is just uh, physically bound literal it's a literal sense but if paul had said you know that this the man's a prisoner to sin then okay that that sounds more figurative but in this case uh, it's not okay great let's uh almost out of time here so let me just let's quickly look at the rest of the textual observation we'll have to talk about word study uh, next time we gather uh, the last one is just looking at the tone of the passage now this is not so much grammatical but it's really just again asking what what will we see as the general tone just of my passage now, earlier in the first step, when we do observations, we sort of look at, and then when we talk about the author, we sort of look at tone of the letter. In this case, we're just trying to look at what's the author's tone here in just our passage. And as we look at it, what would you guys say? What What is Paul's tone here just in these verses? Anybody have any? thought about that with encouragement or all reminding timothy yeah would you would, would you say his tone is um uh, is he exhorting is he instructing is he angry is he um encouraging is you know is he being judgmental i mean notice here we we do have two commands and really i remind you to kindle afresh is almost sounds like a command it's grammatically technically not an imperative but it has the force i think alan noted noticed this it sort of sounds like a command so i mean i would I would say this sort of has the, the, the tone of uh, instruction, but also exhortation. Because he's telling Timothy uh, what he needs to do and why. Right? I remind you to kindle afresh. Why? Because God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power. So, because he's given us that, don't be ashamed and join with me. So this, I think, uh, would you guys agree, disagree, questions, add anything to that? What do you, what do you think? I believe that this instruction also an um, exhortation restore because of the action word remind. Yeah, I mean, we do see some instruction and I think that instruction is based upon the exhortation. Because he does give Timothy a reason you know, here, and that's instruction. But then also he's exhorting him as well. Okay. All right.
as I said, we'll we'll uh we'll cover the the word study portion of it, but let me just pull pull up the um assignment. quickly just to show you and show you the instructions just to make sure so that you don't end up doing the whole the whole book <laughs> sorry pastor arn um, <laughs> notice in this assignment okay this is again assignment 513 in this assignment you'll complete steps 5 and 6 on your assigned passage so maybe i need to underline or put that in bold here um, from Second Timothy. So first, make textual observations. So that's what we did this morning. We just went through an example, Second Timothy. And then second part of the assignment is to conduct word study on at least three significant words in the passage. And then I give you the procedure. So we'll look at that next time we gather together. Uh, since uh, we're out of time right now. And then we'll we'll continue on in the subsequent steps, okay? But I wanted to spend some time on the textual observations just because uh, I think that's important to do as you follow up the diagram to look back at the text, just your text and say, okay, let me pay attention to some particular uh, specific things in the passage, such as the verbs, the pronouns, conjunctions, Things like that. All right. Okay. So we have to for living for a while because there was one parent inquiring, but I was surprised because he was a runaway member before. Oh, really? And he coming back. <laughs> well, that's good. Just like Unisimos. <laughs> So who is Paul? Who sent him back? <laughs> that means you're Philemon. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, uh, hopefully the person stays and uh, is able to become involved again. All right. Well, I'll let you guys go. It's noontime. Uh, Birio, can you... Go ahead and uh, close us in prayer. And again, next, uh, Lord willing, we'll meet next week at the same time and continue.